Hello, it's Scott Manley here, back with another bunch of Deep Space news updates after, what, 10 days? Unfortunately, uh, talking about Soviet space balls took a little longer than I anticipated. But yeah, we're going to start with uh, the launches, and we've got three SpaceX launches in the last 10 days or so. The first one was uh, Cosmo SkyMed FM2, and wow, this was a troubled launch. This is an Italian synthetic aperture radar satellite and it kept on having its launch date pushed back. The first couple of days, it was pushed back because of weather, and then on the third day, it was pushed back because of a wayward boat, and we weren't talking about any small sightseeing boat that just didn't understand the rules of the sea. This was the harmonies of the seas. This is a cruise ship. Uh, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I wish it was like from Disney, because then I could say it was some Mickey Mouse operation, but seriously, how, do you operate a cruise ship and then not realize that this is a closed area of the sea? Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say they were going into a sun-synchronous orbit, which left would have, you know, had to require them to go south and around the Cape. And, you know, if you're going to do that, you could do it from Vandenberg. That would have been a lot easier. But it did eventually get away and we got some really amazing footage from this launch, right? So much so that everybody asked for the ground cameras to be reposted during the live stream, during the stage separation. They didn't quite keep it in frame, but after the second stage engine lit up, if you look very carefully, you can actually see the stiffener ring like spinning away from this thing. It was absolutely glorious. And of course, this we followed the booster down to a wonderful RTLS landing. And yes... Vandenberg, the reason they probably didn't go to Vandenberg was because uh, SpaceX was also launching NROL-87 from Vandenberg to a sun-synchronous orbit, uh, like just a day or so later. And yeah, again, uh, it was a successful launch. It was absolutely uh, amazing seeing. It was the middle of the day and people could still see from the ground uh, little RCS thruster firings as the booster came back. Um, so yeah, <laughs> that was one uh, that was almost, at one point they were almost going to be within like two hours of the next flight, which was going to be a Starlink launch. And in the end, that was shifted back a day and it launched again from the Cape. It was a drone ship landing, so you know, standard run-of-the-mill Starlink launch. However, as of this morning, there seems to be something up with the recovery and the recovery convoy has gone instead of going back to florida they've actually stopped off in nasa in the bahamas the uh, other launch that happened was a soyuz 21a with a forgot upper stage carrying a payload called neutron from plesetsk and this is a mysterious payload presumably military it go went to a 67 degree 2000 kilometer orbit which uh you know, it's a pretty spicy place to be in terms of Van Allen belts. We don't know what it's up to. We do know that the satellite builder has previously built Earth imaging spacecraft. And so that might be what it's up to. Or they might just be testing imaging system in high radiation environments. We almost had a fifth launch yesterday. Uh, Astra launched their Rocket 3, or was supposed to launch their Rocket 3.3 with uh, the Elana, the experimental launch of nano satellites or educational launch of nanosatellites. Anyway, uh, this would have been Astra's first launch from Florida, from Slick 46. Unfortunately, after some weather concerns, they had to call a scrub because of some problem with hardware on the range, which I believe was a radar system which was not functioning correctly. So, uh, yeah, okay, that's the launches. Elsewhere, being Chinese uh, Lunar New Year, and, of course, China came out with some more cool footage to show uh, their space capabilities. And this is a unique view of their Tianwen-1 spacecraft in orbit around Mars. So they must have had a camera on a selfie stick on the spacecraft, which they moved out so that they could get a contact shot showing the, you know, you can see the propulsion system and the solar panels and Mars moving underneath it. It looks absolutely amazing. Um, in Europe, Rocket Factory Alsberg, uh, they're, they're asking for names for their rocket engine, which I thought was a pretty cool thing that I'd announced. Um, so Rocket Factory Alsberg are making a stainless steel ro small rocket. Yeah, they were using stainless steel before SpaceX made it trendy. Uh, they were going to have nine engines, kerosene, liquid oxygen. One of their sort of distinguishing things is their first stage, all their engines, I believe, are using staged combustion, which is obviously way more technically complicated. 
But uh, yeah, they're looking for people, the public, to suggest names and they'll have like a naming competition. Obviously you want something that really captures uh, its Germanic roots and I sort of you know, messed up by <laughs> suggesting that it could be called the, the Ragnar Rocket, but because uh, that's really more northern. They're down in Bavaria, I think. Uh, anyway, yes. In the US, NASA had a whole bunch of stuff related to the space station. So yeah, they had a... So it's official now that US is supporting the space station out to 2030. And now all the headlines are saying space station to be disposed of in 2031. I previously did a video on how difficult that is to pull off successfully. We'll, we'll see what happens. But again, I would really like to see it move to a storage orbit at the very least. But also, on the 25th, they released the the source selection statement for the commercial LEO destinations project. If you remember, um, that was where they looked for people to start building private space stations and they wanted to give them seed money to get them started. And the winners for this were NanoRex, Blue Origin and Northrop Grumman. So the source selection statement basically revealed how these things were rated, you know, what, what they thought about the quality. And they rated them basically on a color scheme, like blue, green, white, yellow, and red. You can figure out which one's good and which is bad. And this is a very strict standard for uh, for this whole thing. So like Nanorax Starlamp got a white rating for its technical side and a white for its business. So that was like squarely in the middle. Same with Blue Origin's Orbital Reef. Northrop Grumman, on the other hand, they got a green for their technical uh, capabilities and yellow for their business case. So the feeling I get is that inflatable modules are still being treated with suspicion by NASA. Now, the other thing was this report revealed all the other submissions, at least not in detail, but they revealed their ratings. So there were 11 other bidders. And uh, yeah, so who, who, most of them, we, these were unknowns. You had like Maverick Space Systems, Orbital Assembly, uh, Think Orbital. They, oh, they got red scores for their technical and business. And a fourth one, Space Villages, got a red technical score and a yellow business score. But, but, moreover, we also had better known names, SpaceX and Relatively to Space. And both of them submitted proposals that were for space stations based upon the upper stage of their forthcoming launch vehicles, Starship and Terran R. So SpaceX actually got a yellow for their... <laughs> their technical thing because basically an upper stage is may although it has lots of internal space that really doesn't well accommodate what a space station could be and the business case was a red i don't think spacex really tried at this frankly they're building starship and they weren't going to change it very much for a potential customer relativity space actually got a slightly better grade on their technical but and and business but again neither of those were selected also, I forgot to talk about this last week. So Axiom, they're the ones building the extension to the International Space Station right now, which will become a space station in its own right. And they actually signed a deal with Space Entertainment Enterprises. Basically a company that wants to do media production in space. They've talked about having sports arenas of some sort in zero G. I have no idea what kind of sports. They would have to custom design something. But they... Uh, have supposedly inked a deal with Axiom to extend their segment with a an inflatable module, which will be a production studio of some sort. Now, I'm not sure how much of a business case this actually has, how much they're going to depend on more funding coming in. I will totally be not surprised if this absolutely falls flat and doesn't happen. But, you know, media in space, it's, uh, it's a possibility. Uh, also, Axiom... Uh, they have, we've finally really got the launch date for Axiom 1, their private mission to the International Space Station. It's going to be March 31st until April 10th. It's going to be at the ISS. And that gives them just a few days before Crew 4 flies. And they're going to be flying on April 15th. They're going to be launching on the same booster that launched Crew 3 a few months ago. Uh, also with the SpaceX fleet, there's an interesting uh, thing that was noticed, was that Go Searcher and, uh, I can't remember, Go Searcher and Go Navigator have been renamed. So the Go was actually Juice Offshore, which were the owners. Now SpaceX has bought these outright 
and they've been renamed to Megan and Shannon, the two astronauts from uh, Crew 1 and Crew 2, you know, Megan uh, MacArthur and Shannon Walker. So yeah, that's going to join Doug and Bob, which are, of course, part of the fleet that's currently headed to the Bahamas. Um, let me see. Uh, Orbex in the UK made a big thing about actually applying for a launch license from the UK. Maybe we'll see a launch later this year, maybe not. Uh, there's also a pretty good chance that Virgin Orbit might actually make the first launch from the UK. Although, I've really got to question what that really means, because I think logistically that would mean attaching the rocket to Cosmic Girl, flying across the Atlantic, landing, and then taking off and launching the rocket. Like, does it really feel like a launch from the UK? You know what I mean? It's it's sort of there in principle. Anyway, um, finally we can't get through a week without talking about JWST and Starship. Not that they're related, it's just that they keep coming up. Um, JWST actually had a really quiet week, just aligning its mirrors while quietly orbiting L2. That is a good thing. Uh, down in Starbase in Texas, well, uh, Jared Isaacman and buddies were flying around in their jets at really low altitude, and that looks fantastic. Uh, obviously, there was all the usual work going on with things being built and moved around, but the big news is there's going to be an official update on Thursday. Elon and hopefully some other people are going to give a presentation about what's going on and what to expect. And I'm looking forward to this, mostly to figure out if there's anything new that hasn't been talked about or whether there's anything we've suspected and we will now get confirmation for it. Either way, I'll be watching and uh, I'll hopefully bring you an update later in the week. So yeah, that's the news. I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.